you see that there are three genera. This is Ebola virus, Marburg virus, and there is a third gener genus where we don't have the virus yet, but only a sequence, an RNA sequence of the Cueva virus. And uh, while Ebola virus has um, five species so far, in Marburg virus there's only one species, which is called Marburg Marburg virus, and then the Cueva virus is a Lovio Cueva virus. I don't know whether I have pronounced this correctly, but <laughs> interestingly, this, uh, this Cueva virus has been identified in Spain and not in Africa, as usually these, um, these filoviruses um, are present, where, where usually these filoviruses are present, but this has been identified in a, in a cave in Spain, and therefore it's called Cueva virus. So, and while we, while we think that uh, filovirus are mainly uh, origin in, in Africa, there are some exceptions. One I have named already, this, this Spanish Cueva virus, but there's also this Lorestan virus, which is, um, which is found in the, in the Philippines. So, most of these, of the filoviruses are highly pathogenic for humans, uh, with the exception of Reston virus, where, which is pathogenic for non-human primates, but not for humans, as far as, as we know. So, this is the morphology of this, of the filoviruses. So, it's, um, it's, it's a very uh, characteristic morphology, as you can see here, with the electron micrograph, and this is a scheme of the, of the viruses. And uh, filoviruses are composed of seven structural proteins. And what you have to keep in mind for this talk is that there is only one surface glycoprotein, the, glyc the GP, which is inserted into the lipid membrane of the, of the particles. Now, <coughs> while filoviruses are mainly um, doing their job in, in Africa, so the first <coughs> documented outbreak of a filovirus took place in Germany in 1967, this is 50 years ago now, and uh, this was introduced by a shipment of infected monkeys, which were imported from Uganda to a vaccine manufacturer, a local ma vaccine manufacturer in Marburg, and uh, at this time they <coughs> used uh, monkey kidney, primary monkey kidney cells for the production of vaccines. And those monkeys that have been imported, they were, they were infected with a virus, a novel virus, which was then later named after the, after the city, Marburg virus. And these are the two guys who um, were very important for the identification of the virus three months after the, after the first patients appeared. This is Dana Slenska and Rudolf Siegert. And they came up then with this electron micrograph of this of Marburg virus. And um, the the identification was done with the help of many, many other national and international scientists. Well, but then there were nine years silence, and then in 1976, there were two outbreaks of, of hemorrhagic fever, one in southern Sudan and one in the Democratic Republic of, Co of Congo, <coughs> then the Sair. And while it was first thought that this is the same virus which induces the, which, which has caused this outbreak, it turned out that these were two different viruses. And they looked pretty much the same as the as Marburg virus. And first it was thought this is another Marburg virus, but then because they were antigenically very different, they were, um, it was clear that this is another, a, a separate uh, virus. And this was called after, the, after a river in the, in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ebola virus. So now there were two members of the family and uh, two uh, species in the Ebola virus genus, Saire Ebola virus and Sudan Ebola virus. And in the following years, there were outbreaks of many outbreaks of, of Ebola virus and also new members of the, of the genus Ebola virus throughout Central Africa. And uh, there were also outbreaks of Marburg virus, which are not listed here, but in common, all these outbreaks had that there were traumatic outbreaks for the, for, the, for the village where they took place and the region where they took place, but they could be contained quite easily by just isolating the patients, by um, contact tracing, and by barrier nursing, what we now call barrier nursing. And this was the case since 2014, and in 2014 we experienced something completely different. This, different, this was the West African outbreak. And now the picture that we had from Ebola virus and the outbreaks Ebola virus causes changed dramatically. This outbreak took place in, as I said, in West Africa, 
and in the uh, region between three countries, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. And while we were used to pictures like this from Ebola virus outbreaks, a severely ill patient with people caring for the patient in, in full protection, now the, the pictures that we saw were, were really different. It's like this. And what you can see here is an angry crowd, crowd which was really not agreeing with the, with the quarantine measures that have been implemented. And uh, during this outbreak, there were several attacks on healthcare workers. There was a lot of um, insecurity in the, in the three countries. And this was the by far largest outbreak of Ebola virus that we had so far. So 28,000 patients, 11,000 fatality, fatalities, which was unprecedented. So, and this had enormous impact on the, on the economy. And um, so the schools, for example, were closed for more than six months. The agricultural outputs dropped dramatically. The activities in mining, which are very important for, the, for, these three, for those three countries, were scaled back. And the cross-border trade stopped completely. And altogether, together, the GDP dropped by 7 to 20 percent. So, and this outbreak took extremely long. And in May 2015, people here were celebrating the end of the, uh, of the outbreak in Liberia. And this was, of course, a, s a success on the one hand. But one week later, there was, well, there was another patient in Liberia. And the outbreak took then until 2016. But finally, the outbreak was contained. And the question is, how has this been achieved? And I, I would love to say that this has been achieved by a new drug or by a new vaccine, but this was not the case. Actually, what ended this outbreak was a lot of education and behavioral changes of the, of the local population. And um, here, for example, you see that there were, as soon as the people agreed to do safe and dignified burials with, um, with, with um, burial teams that were, that, are, that were trained for this purpose, then the, the, a lot of the transmission chains stopped. And what was also important was that the unprecedented international help. So there were many, many people going to, to West Africa. There was infrastructure that was, um, that was um, installed, and there was a lot of money flowing into, into West Africa. So there were lessons that we learned during this outbreak. It, was, it is mainly about health infrastructure if we talk about those outbreaks. And this health, inf health infrastructure needs to be strengthened in many countries facing outbreaks of emerging pathogens and not only Ebola virus. This is probably the most important thing. The next is building trust between national and international helpers and the local population at risk. And this is also very, very important. Then, without community engagement of the people in, this, in, the, in, the, in, in the outbreak, um, the outbreak will never stop. So community engagement is key to, out to contain such outbreaks. And what we also need to keep in mind that it's necessary to improve the preparedness for the known emerging viruses like Ebola virus, but we have also to, pre also to be prepared for the unexpected, meaning the disease XX that we heard yesterday from. So, but what about uh, anti-Ebola virus vaccines? You probably, most of you know that there were feverish um, <coughs> attempts to produce on the one hand vaccines and on the other hand drugs against Ebola virus. And uh, in principle, it is not very complicated to, to, um, to establish an anti-Ebola virus vaccine because the only thing that you have to do is to target the only surface glycoprotein of Ebola virus. You will hear about this in a later talk by Erika. And as soon as you uh, induce in the vaccine uh, an effective antibody and T cell response, then you can really stop, uh, you, you can really protect uh, the people. At the beginning of the Ebola virus outbreak, there were two uh, vaccines, candidate vaccines available, which have been um, established through preclinical trials. This was on the one hand a recombinant vesicular stomatitis virus on the top here, and on the other hand a, a recombinant adenovirus. 
And both of these recombinant viruses have in common that they replace a glycoprotein of the vaccine backbone by the Ebola virus glycoprotein. So because uh, of a personal bias, I would like to talk <laughs> only about the VSV Ebola virus vaccine and not about the, the, chimp ad the, the adenovirus vaccine. And the reason is that this Ebola virus vaccine is um, now used in the current outbreaks and therefore I would like to, to talk about this a bit more. So here, as I said before, the glycoprotein of the vesicular stomatitis virus is replaced by the Ebola virus glycoprotein. And in principle, what you got then is instead of this uh, vesicular stomatitis virus with its own glycoprotein in the, lipid, in the lipid membrane, this vesicular stomatitis virus now carries the Ebola virus glycoprotein. And uh, this has been um, established or this has been developed by Heinz Feldmann. And uh, it turned out that, uh, I mean, it's a replication competent virus. And it turned out that one dose of this, of this vaccine is sufficient to protect macaques from a lethal challenge. And it was, was also interesting that treatment one hour after the infection protected 50% of the animals. And it was also important that uh, against VSV, there is no pre-existing immunity in humans. So this seemed to be an ideal candidate in an epidemic scenario. But the problem was that there was th that at the time when the West African outbreak started, there was no clinical study done with, these, with this vaccine. And then in a feverish if attempt to, to get these, uh, the vesicular stomatitis virus, but also the recombinant adenovirus into clinical studies to maybe use this the, these vaccines also in the West African and the current outbreak at this time. There were uh, several phase one trials in Europe, but also in, in Africa to test for safety and tolerability of this, of the vesicular stomatitis Ebola virus vaccine, and also for immunogenicity. And this was successful and the results of, this, of these uh, phase one trials then informed the phase three trial, which was conducted in, in Guinea, again with this VSV <coughs> CBOF glycoprotein vaccine. And this is the, the Lancet publication that uh, basically has had the message that this uh, Ebola virus vaccine was indeed efficacious in protecting the vaccinees against Ebola virus. This was, you have to keep in mind, this was at the end of the West African outbreak and there were only very few cases where, where it was possible to, to test this vaccine. But uh, this was possible because the, there was a ring vaccination strategy which was used to, for, for the testing of this vaccine. And for those of you who are not familiar with this, <coughs> this was a, a vaccination strategy which was used during eradication of smallpox. So what you do um, with the ring vaccination is, in a ring vaccination is you have here the lab confirmed Ebola virus disease case, and then you vaccinate the high risk contact contacts of this of the patient. You have you vaccinate persons who visited the symptomatic patient, and then you vaccinate healthcare workers and frontline workers. But then you have you have another ring around the contacts here, so you vaccinate also the contact of the contact, <coughs> of the first contact. And then, of course, family members of the person who lived in the same household, and then the neighbors. So basically what you do, you have a, a ring, a safety belt around, around the patient to... Um, so it was then in 2018, in the beginning of 2018, in March, when there was another Ebola virus outbreak in in um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo now, which was also caused by the Sair Ebola virus. And uh, the first cases were reported in March and this was quite rapidly contained in July 2018. And this was the first time when a vaccine was used during an act active outbreak. So here, 3,300 people have been vaccinated against Ebola virus with the VSV Ebola virus GP. So altogether 53 cases and 30 deaths. So at this time, everybody was afraid that, the, that patients will use the Congo River to finally end up in the, in the capital, Kinshasa. But fortunately enough, this was really possible to contain quite rapidly. 
and we don't know yet whether this vaccine played is its role during the containment of this outbreak. So at least I don't know. And then in July, the outbreak was declared over. And then in August, there was the next Ebola virus outbreak, which is still active. And this also took place in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but now not in the, in the eastern part of the country, but uh, now in the western part of the country, as you can see here. And the two pro provinces that, um, that see cases currently are in at the border to Uganda and to Rwanda. And two provinces are, co are called North Kivu and Ituri. And these are unfortunately <laughs> densely populated provinces. And they have, as I said, borders with Uganda and Rwanda. And in addition, what complicates the situation very much, there is a humanitarian crisis, which is caused by civil wars, which, is, uh, which lasts for, for decades now. There are intense insecurities in this region. There are one million internally displaced persons. And <coughs> there are outbreaks of cholera, measles, and monkeypox in the same region. <coughs> so what we have here is, is really a very complicated and dangerous situation with the possibility that the outbreak will spread to, to other countries, to Uganda, to Rwanda. And um, I guess it's not clear how this outbreak um, will end. So here you can see the population densities in, in DRC, and you see that this is really the highest populated area in the, in the country beside Kinshasa area. So today, and the li latest number that I could find is that we have 420 cases, 240 deaths, and um, this is really ongoing, this outbreak. And what is really concerning is uh, this figure that I, that I took from a, from a publication, from a report from, this, from, the, uh, uh, from the outbreak. And what you see here is that this is the number of cases which were outside of, of known transmission chains. In, and what you can see, I don't know whether you can read it, but in some, in some, some times, some days, there were more than 70% of the, of the cases which were, which were outside the known transmission um, <laughs> chains, meaning we don't know really what happens during this outbreak. We don't know when we, when we read the numbers, 400 cases, whether this is really true or whether this is much more. So and this, are, this is another, um, another map of the, of the area. And what you can see here in the, the red points, I don't know whether you can, can identify them from the back, but the red points means these are um, uh, the security incidents, how it is called here. And um, these are, um, the in, in yellow, these are the places which are under, under control of, of rebels. In within the within the uh, DRC in, in North Kivu province, and then you can also see the the cases, and you see this is a mixture of um, of uh, insecurity of, of of incidents of incidents of um, of s uh, security incidents, sorry, <laughs> and uh, and the, and the cases, and then it's very difficult to operate in this in this region. So. There is a lot of uh, vaccination activity uh, taking place during this outbreak. Currently, we have more than 30,000 people who consented and were vaccinated um, on two days ago. This is a ring vaccination which takes place. So contacts of patients are, are vaccinated, but also healthcare workers and also the burial teams. And there is, this is really a lot. So for the three months, uh, the outbreak is currently running so we have more than 30,000 vaccines so this for, for me this is really uh, wonderful to see that it's possible in such an in such a very difficult and dangerous situation to have a vaccination campaign running there's also a clinical try which is uh, going to happen within the start within the next days i i hope and this clinical trial tests anti ebola virus treatment options during this outbreak so this is a randomized controlled clinical trial which compares three different antibody treatments and an antiviral drug. There is no placebo arm included. The sponsor is the INBR of the Congo. This is the institute where uh, Professor Muyembe Tambun is, is located. And the study arms are on the one hand the, the, um, the compound Remdesivir from Gilead. This is um, 
maybe you remember this is the compound that was uh, established by, by the group of Sina Barbary from the Samrit. Then it's ZMAP, which is tested. There is another antibody cocktail, which is tested. And then there is this MAP114. This is um, from the National Institute of Biomedical Research from, um, from TRC. So this is, this is really good news that it's possible to do this, this clinical study within, with, within the outbreak. And uh, although you might not like that there is no placebo control in this, in this clinical trial, but I think there are that many ethical problems when, when, as when planning such, an, um, such a clinical trial that we, well, we have to make compromises. So now if you look at outbreaks of emerging viruses, it's clear they are unpredictable. They have an impact on all aspects of life, on individual health, public health, of course, on social networks and economy. So first of all, it's of course the public health authorities who have to deal with these outbreaks, with quarantine measures, epidemiological investigations, risk assessment, and so on. But the question is, what can we as an academic research institute, what, what can we do? And I think there is a lot of tasks that we can, that we can really um, do. On the one hand, it's identification and characterization of novel viruses. So if there is the disease X which is appearing, this is certainly our, our task. We have to rapidly develop diagnostic tools in this case. And patient management can be also one of the tasks that we can do. Then we need to rapidly develop vaccine candidates and antivirals. And what is also for me very important, and this well, what, I, what I mentioned before concerning the clinical trial in, during the Ebola virus outbreak, we need to promote investigator-initiated clinic, clinical studies that, that help during such outbreaks. Um, it is also clear that this cannot be done by academic institutions alone. What we need definitely is the help of, of the industries to develop and produce and marketing antivirals and vaccines. And I think there is a lot of what we, what we need to do, what CEPI is um, engaging in. And uh, I guess there is, <coughs> we, we actually we, we did a lot and we um, were successful but there are a lot of steps to do to, to get this really successfully done. Thank you very much for your attention.